Gliotibial band syndrome is one of the leading causes of lateral knee pain in runners. The iliotibial band is a superficial thickening of tissue on the outside of the knee and extends from the outside of our pelvis over the hip and the knee and search just below the knee. Now the band is crucial to stabilising the knee during running and obviously it moves from behind the femur to the front while we're walking. Now the continual rubbing of the band over the lateral femoral epicondyle combined with repeated flexion and extension of the knee during running may be the cause why the area becomes inflamed but is highly debatable. We know it's related to biomechanical overuse and overload but is it really a friction syndrome? It is believed iliotibial band syndrome to be associated with excessive friction between the track and the lateral femoral epicondyle friction which inflames the track or the bursa. However, there is the perception of movement of the ITV across the epicondyle is an illusion because of the changing tension in its anterior and its posterior fibres. Nevertheless, slight medial and lateral movement is possible and it's been proposed that the ITB syndrome is caused by incom increased compression of a highly vascularized and innervated layer of fat and loose connective tissue that separates the ITB from the epicondyle. Let's look at the anatomy of the iliotibial band a little bit closer. So we know it's a thickening of the lateral outer soft tissue that envelops the leg it starts near the anterior superior iliac spine and it inserts into the girdy strip called the tibia. And the thickened tissue is known as fascia and in this area it is called the fascia lata. And the thickened band is called the iliotibial band. The muscles that insert into the proximal upper portion of this band are the tensor fascia lata and a portion of the gluteus maximus and the gluteus medius, medius muscles. During its latter course, it splits medially into the iliopatellar band and laterally into the iliotibial tract. At its insertion into the tibia at Gerdes tribunal, it blends with the biceps femoris and also the vastus lateralis. Now, the size of any bursa in clinical iliotibial band syndrome may be minute to the, <clears throat> to the point where it is often unable to be detected, especially on high resolution MRI scans. Symptoms of iliotibial band range from stinging sensation just above the knee joint on the outside of the knee or along the entire length of the iliotibial band to the thickening of the tissue at the point where the band moves over the femur. The pain may not occur immediately during activity but may intensify over time, especially as foot strikes the ground. Now, pain might persist after the activity and may also be present above and below the knee where the ITB actually attaches to the tibia. Iliotibial band can also occur where the IT band connects to the hip, though this is less likely, especially in sports injury. Commonly occurs during pregnancy, especially as the connective tissue loosens and the woman gains weight, each process adding more and more pressure. So iliotibial band syndrome at the hip also commonly affects the elderly as well. And iliotibial band at the hip is a lot less studied, so fewer treatments are generally known. This may also happen when a child or teenager's hip grows faster than the band and it creates tightness over the hip and the knee, therefore creating a popping and even a snapping over the hip or knee. Now pain from the ITB is easily recognised as sharp or burning pain on the outside of the knee when running. Now, typically an athlete is unable to run through the ITB pain. So early on symptoms will subside shortly after the run is over but will return with the next run and usually after a reproducible amount of time. Later if there's been no positive intervention the pain may come on sooner and persist with walking or going up and down stairs. And tenderness may also be felt on the outside of the knee 
when the pressure is applied, especially when the knee is slightly bent. So this is our gold standard in palpating. There is not usually any swelling associated with this problem, but the band itself may become thickened. So looking at some of the intrinsic factors, absolutely no doubt that tightness in the iliotibial band <coughs> plays a big role. Myofascial restriction in the hip and the thigh musculature will obviously add and increase tension onto that iliotibial band. Weakness in our hip abductors, especially in um, distance runners. Weakness or poor control of the knee muscles, especially the quads. Dominance of our anterior hip muscles, so the TFL over the posterior muscles, such as the glutes. Uh, excessive flat feet or high arches, bow legs or knock knees, if we've got any leg length inequality or discrepancies, and even limited ankle range of movement. Now, there's no million dollar prize for guessing extrinsic factors. Usually comes down to increases in our training methods. Now, starting with if we're increasing excessive mileage, if we're increasing the intensity of the workload, so sudden increase in intensity of training. Um, an example of that would be increasing hill work, running up and down, and changing maybe even the surfaces that we run on, so going from soft um, to hard surfaces or even running on uneven loads. So wherever we've gone, a change in either the intensity, the duration and also the length, there are extrinsic factors leading towards the VATBL band syndrome.